In this video, I'm going to take you through a program activity about standard in, so reading things from standard input using the standard in class and uh, using arrays in Java. You should uh, go onto the website and download the standard in arrays zip file, and in that file you'll find uh, some partially completed source code as well as several of the support classes like standard in and standard out, uh, data file students.txt, as well as these two PDF files. So if you want, you can just complete the print out the PDFs and uh, work on it on paper, or you can go ahead and uh, load these into create an empty Eclipse project, copy the source code into it, and then uh, work on uh, completing the code in the Eclipse ID. Uh, that's the way I'm going to show you. Uh, we'll start off with the standard in activity. So if you haven't done it already, uh, go through maxmin.java filling in the missing code as well as go through students.java filling in the missing code. Here's maxmin.java. Its goal is to read a bunch of integers from standard input, so either interactively from the user or um, uh, directed in from a file on the command line. And here's the person that's entered these uh, numbers separated by white space. Then you hit control D or control Z and it prints out the maximum or the minimum of that series of numbers. A very common thing you might want to do in a uh, program is compute the, the max or the min over some data. What shall we put in these first two lines? Well, we want to first val you know, create a value and initialize min and max to it. Uh, there are a variety of ways we could do this, but one way we could do it is just to go ahead and read that first integer. You could imagine maybe there's only one integer in this file, like 23, and we could call that 23, well, it it's the maximum. If there's only one number, that's the maximum and the minimum. And we can send the, the minimum then also equal to that same value. We're going to start off with the max and min both equal to that, that first value. Uh, note you want to do it this way. If we were to do something like this, we'd read two integers. And so in this example, we would have read 23 and 45, but 23 would be the maximum and 45 is the minimum, which isn't correct. And if that's all the data in the file, then we're going to get an incorrect answer. So we don't want to do that. We'll start both of them off like that. We want to keep looping now, reading in additional integers until we run out of integers. So standard in has a method called is empty, and it returns true once you're out of data. Well, we want to keep looping while uh, it's not empty. So keep looping while there is data in the file. We read that next integer into the value local variable. And then what we can do is we can just compare the value. If the value is greater than the thing we're currently calling max, well, we can send the max equal to that value. And similarly, if the value is less than our current best minimum, we can set the minimum equal to that value. And if we run this, we can go ahead and run it. And we can enter this data, 23, 45, 17, 56, 32. We can hit return. It, standard in just separates things on white space, be it spaces or uh, line feeds, tabs, etc. And hit control D, and we get the correct answer. So that's the solution for max min. Let's have a look at students.java. Students.java reads in a file from standard input, so we're probably going to read this from a file because there's going to be a lot of input. The first number in that file is indicating how many total students are in some class, and then on each line you're going to have a first name, a last name, an email address, and then a section number. So if you haven't already done so, go through this program and fill in all the missing sections. And then let's go ahead and fill these in. Now the very first thing in the file is this integer. We want to put this into, we're going to have a uh, local variable n, standard in, and we just call read int, and now we've loaded that number like 130 into that. A common thing you do in uh, programs is often set up parallel arrays. So we're going to have a bunch of local variables. They're all going to be arrays and they're all going to be of the same size. In this case, we're going to have an array to store the first name, an array to store the last name, one to store the uh, email address, and one to store the section number. So what do you suppose? If the first name's a string, what's the last name? It's also a string. What shall we call 
the variable name for the email address, well, cleverly we'll call it email. And in fact, I mean, as you, if you look down in the program, that's actually what's down here, so we have to call it email. These are all just copies of this. They're all string arrays, and they all contain n elements. The only guy that's a different type is the section. He's an integer array. So when we declare this guy, we can't use string. If we do something like this, it ain't going to work. All right, it's unhappy. You need to use the same data type. Now we've got four different arrays. And when you have a parallel array, what you're going to do is organize things by the index. And so if you put a zero index into the first, last email and section arrays, you're going to have the data corresponding to that very first student. Whereas if you put a one index into each of these arrays, you'll be storing the, uh, the second person. Let's loop over the data. How much data do we have? Well, uh, we have these n items. So let's create a, a for loop. And as is tradition, we'll call the index variable i starting at 0. And how far do we want to go? Well, we want to go, we've got n total data points. And so the standard way you do that is loop while i is strictly less than n. That will, since we're starting at 0, that will uh, read in n total values, and then after each loop we're going to increment that i variable by 1. What do we want for the indexes of these four arrays? Well, we just want that i variable. And we're going to, they'll all be indexed by the same variable. Now we need to load. Remember, each line has the first name, the last name, then the email, and the section number. How do we read them in? Well, if we're reading a name, it's a string. If it's an email address, it's also a string. And if it's a section number, then it's an integer. So that takes care of the, the input portion of it. Print out the email addresses of all students in section 4. We're going to print out some a section 4 header. We're going to loop over all the data, just like when we loaded the arrays. So our arrays have all the data. The good thing is, once they're in these parallel arrays, we can keep looping over them and doing multiple different computations. How do we determine if we should print out a particular thing? Well, we can see if the section number of the current one we're on, so section i, does it equal the target section? That is, does it equal 4? And if so, we want to print out, what are we printing out? We're printing out the email address. Okay. Email bracket i. And if you haven't seen the standard out before, it's also a, a helper class similar to standard in or standard draw. Uh, you could also just put system.out.println here if you wanted to. It would it would do the, do exactly the same thing. Section 5, similarly, how do we determine if it's section 5? Section bracket i equals 5, and if so, we want to print out the email addresses of the people in section 5, and so we can do it that way. All right, Eclipse is all happy. I've got no red things. We want to input this from a file, and since we want to do it from a file, we need to run this from the command line, and we're going to run it so we can see what's in my directory here. I've got a student's txt file. And there it is, 130 with all the names in it. And I can run students. Use the less than symbol to redirect in, students.txt. And there you go. Moving on, let's go to the arrays activity. So if you haven't done the arrays activity, uh, go ahead and fill in the missing code there, starting with how many. How many is a pretty simple program. It just looks at how many command line arguments were passed on the command line and then prints out a message telling you that there were zero command line arguments or one command line argument. And that's about all it does. How many things are in this array? All arrays always come with a length property. If you want to know how many things are in the args array, you can call args.length. If you want to know how many things were in you know, any array, you can always just call .length, and it will tell you. And we just assign that equal to a local variable n. And now, 
we've got to either print out an S or no S. Well, the only circumstance we don't print out an S. So if it's a zero, it's an S. If it's a three, it's an S. The only circumstance you don't use that S in English is if it's equal to one. And we can run that zero command line arguments. And I can go and give it some command line arguments like the quick fox. We run that and we get three command line arguments. Again, it's plural. And if we knock it down to just one command line argument, it doesn't print the plural. So pretty simple program. The main point of this one is there's always a length property, which is a nice feature of the Java language. Not all languages allow you to easily determine how many things are in, a, in an array. Next array program is discrete distribution. It takes a series of integers on the command line specifying how frequent those different events are. So the higher the number, the more frequent. So there might be six events where the last event is three times as likely as the others. So it's a way to model a discrete probability distribution. Now what we're going to do is read in these frequency values. How many things are in are passed to this program on the command line argument? Well, args.length is the number of things just like before. Now we need to create what we're going to do is create an array to hold these different values. But instead of being an array of type string like the args array, it's going to hold the integer value. So what type do we need? We need the int primitive before the brackets. We're querying a new array. How big is it going to be? n. So there, it's all sorted, right? Oh, it's still red, huh? How come it's still red? Whenever you create an array, you need this new operator. This creates an array and initializes it uh, and to have n available slots in the array. We now got to load each of those positions with the value. We're going to parse the value from the command line. So remember we're using command line input, things coming in on the args array, not something from standard input. As is common, we'll use the variable i starting at 0, going strictly less than 9, and then incrementing 1 by every position. And then we want to load the ith item in that frequency array. And what do we want to put in there? Well, we want to parse the ith command line argument. So all this first bit is doing is just converting this string array into an integer array. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and count up the sum of all the frequencies on that command line. We'll start a total. We'll start it at 0. All right, not really necessary. In Java, integers are always initialized to start at 0, but not a bad habit to get into. Not all languages uh, start va variables at a uh, default value. How do we sum up the frequencies? Well, we created this frequency array, so all we need to do is add to the total. So this is total equals total gets total plus the frequency at position i. And now we've got a total frequency. And kind of the hard heavy lifting here, the part that actually draws an event with a probability proportional to that frequency information is, has been done for you. And we can run it. We get that because I didn't give it any command line arguments. And let's go use uh, the example from here. Discrete distribution. And we'll go around there. That time we got event 5. We got event 1 then 2, every time we're going to get something else. But 5 is popular, right? And it should be popular because we've got a higher frequency. Final activity, the birthday paradox. What this does is simulate how many people must enter a room before at any two of them share a birthday. And it takes a single command line argument, the number of days in the year, and then runs the simulation uh, printing out how many people had to enter the room before somebody had the same birthday. First of all, we need to get the command line argument. And you have one command line argument. It's an integer. So we can do integer.parseInt. 
on command line argument 0. That gets us the number of days, total number of people. What's it's on? What's it unhappy about here? Don't know. Let's try and fix some other stuff and see if that one goes away, huh? People starts at zero. That looks all fine to me. We're going to create an array to track what day somebody was born on. All right. We need a slot in this array for every day in our um, calendar year. So however many things we have in D. What type do we want? Well, it just tracks whether somebody has a birthday on, say, day number five of the year or not. And it's just a true or false value, so we can use a Boolean array. How big does it need to be? It needs to be D positions big. This will auto-initialize to the default. The default value of a Boolean is false, so there's n no need in Java anyway to loop over those and set them all equal to false. Increment the number of people. Ah, see, our problem's gone away. So sometimes Eclipse gives you kind of uh, erroneous feedback. It was really complaining about this line, but there wasn't anything wrong with that line. There was something wrong with this line, and it was confusing it. Increment the number of people by one. Simple as that. People plus plus. Draw a random day between 0 and D minus 1. Remember our friend math.random. It returns a number between 0 and uh, 1.0, not inclusive of 1.0. If we want to draw a number between 0 and d minus 1, the first thing we want to do is multiply this by d. Now it's giving me a type error because this is of type double, so a double times an integer is still a double, and so we'll just cast it in, right? Be careful, you don't want to do that. This will cast this double to an integer which will always result in 0, and then multiply by d, you're always going to get 0. So be very careful when you try and do something like this. You want that cast to happen on the multiplicate, multiplied value of random uh, times d, and uh, not have this cast uh, bind to the math.random. It's now happy again. And what do we want to test? Well, We've drawn a random day, so somebody new has entered the room, and are they somebody that already, have we already found somebody with that birthday? And so we can test if that particular day is already true, then we've, we've had a successful uh, overlap on birthdays. And this is the way you want to do this. Uh, this is kind of a bad habit to get into. This will do the same thing. But it's kind of an amateur move, uh, you know, and it's also somewhat dangerous because this is not um, doing what you think it's doing. It's actually doing an assignment. Java won't protect you against that. So I recommend the students always stay away from uh, comparing booleans equals equals to anything. Booleans do not need to be compared against true or false. They are true or false. So you can either put the boolean value inside the if condition or the negation by something like the not but don't be doing that equals equals business if we did not have a collision so certainly the first time we go through this all these things are false so we definitely aren't going to break out of the loop if we didn't have a collision then what do we do well we just mark that day as true and that should be good and let's go ahead and run it I haven't set my command line argument. 365 days. Go ahead and run it. Whoops. We didn't get any output. Why didn't we get an output? Because I forgot to fill in this line. We actually want to display this people thing we've been incrementing. We actually got to display it. Otherwise, uh, programs have much to do about nothing. And we get different values every time because it's random, but the birth, it's a called the birthday paradox because it takes a surprisingly few people uh, to actually have an overlap on uh, some pair.